two minutes of introduction. So hopefully our other colleagues who want to join can um, join us in a few minutes. Um, let me welcome everyone. This, this hearing is called to order. This is the Committee on Sustainable Development Goals, Innovation, and Futures Thinking. And um, our agenda today is to hear Senate Resolution Number 393, which is um, called in aid of legislation on the effects of COVID-19 pandemic on various sectors, their innovations and strategies to prepare for and adapt to the new normal and their action plans to prepare for all possibilities and outcomes in the post-COVID-19, taking into consideration strategic foresight to analyze positive, possible futures based on available intelligence and knowledge. So we all know that these are challenging times for all of us, and it's really important that um, the different sectors in our uh, government, and including um, NGOs and um, private citizens, are able to avail of um, the best information and knowledge coming from government. And that is why I feel that it's very crucial at this time that we take advantage of um, expertise that we can call on um, worldwide um, by virtue of these online hearings to help us understand more about um, what is futures thinking and uh, what, what does it mean to be using these strategic tools? What does it mean to look at possible outcomes so that we can effectively plan for the new normal? So for today, I'm very happy to welcome our, um, our resource persons, um, many of whom come from different time zones. Thank you for waking up very early <laughs> to join us. Uh, it's one o'clock in the Philippines right now. Um, so colleagues, what I'd like to do is um, let's allow our resource persons to finish their presentation um, before we ask questions, unless really there's a key point that you're ha you're str we are struggling with that we cannot understand. Of course, I will uh, give you time to ask those clarifications. But ideally, let's let them finish their presentations. They will have about 15 to 20 minutes to present. Um, this is a part one, and I'd really like to maximize um, their presence with us. So after the, the presentations, and there are only two main presentations scheduled for today, uh, we can have our Q&As uh, with our colleagues. But we also have our local um, resource person, so that will also be called on uh, if we have time within the day. If not, we will continue those um, presentations in the next hearing on Thursday. So for now, let me acknowledge the presence of our colleagues here, um, Senator De La Rosa, Senator Hontivero, Senator Coco Pimentel. I'm not sure if anyone else joined us, but those are the three that I'm aware of. Um, if I have another colleague here, be sure to call me, let me know. And then may we also request that if you want to say something, send a message on the chat box. We will be closely monitoring it. But of course, the senators can always just um, press the talk button and go ahead. No, But in case um, you want to wait it out, then just send a message on the chat box and we will monitor that. Um, and Senator Marcos is also here. So welcome to all our colleagues. All right. So um, we will proceed right now. And our first speaker is Dr. Sohil Ineatula, and he will be discussing, he will, he will present a general discussion on what is futures thinking, and then futures thinking uh, in the time of COVID. So welcome, um, Dr. Sahil, and thank you very much for joining us today. Is Dr. Sahil around? If Dr. Suhil is not around, then I will... Uh, Dr. Suhil is here, but he, maybe he can't hear me. You, uh, uh, there you are. Off or on? A video off or on? Hello. Um, I can hear you fine. I'm just checking. Uh, uh, can you hear me fine? Yes. You can hear me, and do you want video on or off, Senator? Uh, video on is good. Okay, fantastic. Okay, 
Uh, but thanks so much for arranging this. And if everyone can hear me, I'll just start. Uh, Maybe just, Dr. Sohil, a little yeah. bit. I, I think it's, I mean, I can hear you, but it's a, li a little bit weak. So let me increase the sound. Okay, how about now? How's the sound now? That's better. Okay, fantastic. Uh, thanks so much. So I'll just jump into it. So I think we're all in the same situation. And the main argument with futures thinking is, is accelerated change. But with heterogeneous views of reality, people see this change differently. So futures thinking, we want to make sense of this change, not to predict per se, but to use the future to change today. Now, the other thing we do, we always try to meet people where they're at to figure out what's the zone of change. Like after this meeting, I have a presentation in Cairo and I'm not going to Cairo, obviously. The people's zone of change in Cairo may be different from where you are in the Philippines versus other places, and each person is different. So when we do this to try to figure out if you can't figure out your zone of control, then people feel depressed. So we set up these centers for futures in many places because the rate of change, people want to increase their ability to influence, otherwise they'll feel actually overwhelmed. So we have centers now, Australia Federal Police in Canberra, Interpol has a center for futures in Singapore. The PM's office in Singapore, as you know, has one PM's office in Malaysia, office of the president in South Korea. And we have the largest foresight program in the world at Tom Kong University in Taiwan. So there's actually attempts, institutional attempts to make sense of this change. And the markets is very good research. A recent uh, report by Rohrbeck, corporations that do futures thinking, their profits go up 33% our market capitalization goes up 200%. My colleague, Professor Chen, just went through, did a survey on students who've taken futures thinking work. The ones who take it, two things happen. They understand that you can't solve a problem with one field, you need multiple fields. For COVID-19, you need engineers, you need ecologists, you need medical experts. The second thing students understand is you have to be open to alternatives. So future thinking is very much going from one future to many futures. Now in our work, our challenge is everyone wants us to predict. They say, please tell us the future. And we try not to do that because once you predict, you assume the world is a closed system. The act of prediction can change the future because we live in something called complex adaptive systems. Prediction changes what's going to happen. So we don't see this as prediction now. We go with something called the learning journey. So the learning journey is reflective. We question our assumptions on technology, on demographics, on gender. We're actually questioning everything all the time. Now, once we do this well, we move to something called narrative foresight. Narrative foresight, the issue is not technology or demographics or a disease. The issue are the stories we bring to it. You remember the global financial crisis 12 years ago? Financial Times had a brilliant article saying very clearly, it's a crisis in search of a narrative. No one had a solution because they didn't know what the crisis was. Is it a mortgage crisis? Is it a banking crisis? Is it a financial crisis? Is it a crisis with the world capitalist system? Or is this the rise of Asia? The conclusion was, this is basically a banking crisis. So the strategy was save Wall Street, Main Street, mortgage prices are not so important. So we always try to figure out what are the narratives that we can use wisely but the narratives tell us what's possible. So what's possible in terms of narratives today? Narrative number one is blame game. Who's wrong? You find the country, the person, and you blame them, and you get quick votes. Narrative number two, this is a contagion crisis. Lockdown. Stay safe. The metaphor we use is the hammer and the dance. Narrative number three, this is a financial crisis. This economic collapse, we could have a seven-year recession coming. Now, there's another narrative that says, wait a second, don't get lost on COVID-19. COVID-19 is a symptom of industrial farming. It's a symptom of climate change. This is phase one in many more crises to come, but climate change is the issue. Now, then you have a group of people who say, yes, that's all true, but see this as an opportunity. So the author Roy says, the narrative that's the most useful is, it's a message from nature. What messages are we being given? Is it stop polluting? Is it rethink how you do industrial development? Is it move towards sustainability? 
the first thing we do in foresight work, what's the narrative and shift the narrative. Now, once you've kind of figured out which story you want to live in and use to create the future you want, part two is what do you have to get rid of? So we call futures as the used future. What institutional practices are we doing today that don't work, but we keep on doing them? When I work with Mental Health Australia on the future of suicide, the biggest issue is, the used future is, no one has shared data. Everyone says solving suicide mental illness is basically a world of roadblocks. So the used future is no data sharing. Health doesn't know what police are doing, doesn't know what the depression agencies are doing. So first, if you want to move forward, solve that. What's the used future in the Philippines response to COVID-19? What's the used future in any organization? And once you figure that out, of course, you have to anticipate what's next. And that we already know we're talking about what is the next crisis, what's the next economic, uh, economic crisis ahead of us. But then we still don't know, so then we use alternatives. Prediction says X will happen. Alternatives said there's a range of possibilities. There's a range of scenarios. So what are some of these scenarios? A few weeks ago, we went through every possible text on COVID-19, and we found four scenarios that kept on emerging everywhere. Scenario one was very clear. This is a zombie apocalypse. Run for the hills. This was a frightening future. People felt scared. And so they're looking for people to blame. Scenario two is slow down to speed up. Take a year off. This is your chance to figure out what's most important. Shut people down. This year you slow down. Next year you use that cons conservation to even get faster. Scenario three says, wait a second. This is a chance to rethink everything. This is the great health awakening. We have, remember in uh, 2002 during SARS, there was a company called Alibaba. They just started. Their entire business model was destroyed within a day of what happened. They quickly decided, let's go online. They said, aha, let's do something else. Scenario three is, it's not going back to business as usual. We change the things we don't want, we transform. But this assumes a vaccine or a cure. Scenario four is, there's no vaccine. There's no cure. This is seven years of depression and recession. <clears throat> so the scenarios, we don't know which one it is, but we use the scenarios to outline national strategies, global strategies, personal strategies. Now, once you've figured out the alternatives, then you have to decide what's next. No, you have to decide where do you want to be? What's your strategy? What's the vision? There's clearly divergent thinking to convergent thinking. So when I've worked with many cities. We bring together citizens. We work with them. We bring together academic experts with data. We bring political leaders such as yourself, and then we bring business together. So we develop a shared vision of where we wish to go. And that takes some time. The Gold Coast, one city, 12 years ago, when we did the visioning, the big vision was light rail. Let's reduce car usage. No one believed that was possible. Gold Coast now has light rail. When I ran this two years ago, they said, we want to be the first city where there's no cars at all. The carless city. And of course, everyone in the room started laughing. And I said, wait a second, 12 years ago, you said light rail, you made it happen. This tells you you can make the vision. The vision gets us going, where do we want to be when we do something called backcasting? What happened? Action learning steps. Now, if you've done that well, you're on your way, but you have to remember culture. Culture either supports the vision, supports the scenarios, or hinders them. So I'm working with uh, what's called Edmund Rice Education. There are Catholic schools everywhere. And the one thing that jumped out the most was students said, we don't want store-bought. We want tailor-made education. We want tailor-made students at the center, flexible. And when we ran these workshops six months ago, everyone said, brilliant, it will never happen. Now I got a call from the headmaster said, what seemed impossible in already May 2020, we've created it, COVID-19 was the hammer that forced us to change. We ran this with your agency, NEDA, and we were looking at the future of Filipino education. The experts said, actually, the current metaphor is the factory, standardized surveillance, everyone studies at the same time, learns at the same rate. It, and what I said, so what's the new metaphor? My colleagues in Norway said, it's a jazz orchestra. You have excellence and you work together. My, the Filipino experts said, actually, it's the wrecking ball. We can't mutate, we have to destroy the old factory before we make a shift. So as you start to think this through, you say, what's the new narrative? And that becomes the big issue for COVID-19. Is it 
just a pandemic, a war against a pandemic, or can we look for opportunities to see it as a portal, a portal, for, a portal to somewhere else? So whatever strategy you use, whatever story you, you create, futures thinking starts from one, how is the world changing? It's a learning journey. What things do I have to get rid of in that journey to use future? What are some of the scenarios to make sense of the changing world? What's the metaphor I need to link to my new vision? Of course, most importantly, how do I make this real? How do I link the vision to where I wish to be? Many countries I work with, great vision, but the budgetary process doesn't link to the vision. So everyone knows it's fake. In New Zealand, they said, okay, GDP has had its era. We want a triple bottom line system, and now we will ensure the budget links to the triple bottom line, meaning prosperity, people, planet. And of course, the last part of all this is each one of us. Foresight work, when everything is changing, people are stressed, they believe zombies are everywhere, there's conspiracy theorists everywhere now, it's slowing down, it's the meditation part, the mindful part, it's saying, what's my own personal narrative, how do I need to change? To conclude, one CEO I was working with, he said he understood the future before, now when he goes to meetings, he never knows what's going on. The future seems strange. It's like it's being in a tennis court. He doesn't know what court, what, you know, what is he playing on? So now he changed his metaphor for the man who's good at one court to the man who could play in, on many courts, grass and clay. So that means for him learning new skill sets. So we're all in this situation together, some poorer, some richer. And of course, it's unequal, but we all have to learn new skill sets. Futures thinking creates futures literacy, which helps us be far more prepared with the future we wish to see. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. <clears throat> and within Thank my 15 you. minutes. I know that was really fast. Um, that's, that was too fast. I, I want more details, but on that note, you may can I- say for that. Yeah, um, just because you just delivered your, your, um, your talk in, in a good time, um, while, while it is still fresh in the minds of my colleagues, is there anyone who'd like to ask a question at this point? Because if there's none, um, before I proceed to the next speaker, um, I just wanna run down a few things that you said, and, um, and then maybe you can elaborate on them now and then later on again. But um, very quickly um, for now, um, I have, I'm looking at your notes and um, to summarize, you're basically saying that um, there's so much change that is happening and we all have a different view about it. So, you know, the, the four senators and I can all be listening to you and we may be taking in this whole scenario differently, right? So like from my perspective as an advocate for uh, women and children, as Senator Risa Honteveros is, then we may be seeing the suffering through the eyes of a mother, you know, because that is our perspective. Senator um, Bato de la Rosa, on the other hand, um, with his um, years and decades of experience on the battlefield, would be seeing it through the eyes of peace and order, you know, ensuring that um, uh, everything is calm in the battlefield and uh, um, making sure that uh, his frontliners, which would be the men in uniform are doing their jobs and they're well cared for, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then you also mentioned that um, every person has their own sense of control also. So if I start feeling like no one's taking care of the women, then I'll start feeling that sense of loss of control. And that's where, that's where ideally futures thinking can come in, such that yep. decision makers like us would have a better grasp of, there, there would be, in other words, we would have a better sense of control of the, the changing environment. That we would, you know, we would um, be able to, like you said, not predict, but be able to maybe see it through different lenses and then create our own narrative. So I guess that's my question. I was a little bit surprised that the narrative aspect comes in. So are you saying that communication has a big role to play in futures thinking? Is that, is would, that the message? Yeah. I was working at FAO in Rome on the future of food. And so it was a global project on food futures. And then one of the brilliant scientists had developed these four scenarios with incredible data. 
And I said, how is your report going? He said, it's brilliant, but no one reads it. Okay, so okay. I said, great data. Once you have the data, how you communicate the story to get buy-in with the futures you want. So this is really exactly as you said, the narrative means communication, means people understanding your worldview. So the, really goal, the real goal is futures literacy. I have a project starting tomorrow with on future of disability. And we're asking as COVID-19 spreads, how do we ensure persons with disability enhance their agency so they're not left behind? That's very, that's really interesting to me. I mean, I was a little bit surprised that the communication aspect came in here. It's it's interesting that you mentioned that um, example because um, um, there's a podcast that I follow. It's called Freakonomics. It's it's actually oh, yeah. based that's, on a book. And great. the one I was yeah. watching yesterday, the introduction was how this started as a bad idea because the right the the author of the book, if I'm not mistaken, I think there are two of them. But anyway, one of the authors didn't think a podcast was a good idea, but he went with it anyway, until one day, I think one of the hosts, the one who runs the show now asked him, how many people read your paper? Cause he's an economist and he comes up with like volumes and volumes of, of um, studies. And he said, yeah, after like, whatever, let's say after five years, five people read my study. So, and then it turns out now through the podcast, I think thousands of people are now hearing his study. So, that, that is a big takeaway for me, that um, the communication aspect is um, a key factor here. And then before I, before I let go of you, just temporarily for our other speaker, quick question also, because um, the committee is actually the Committee on Sustainable Development Goals, Innovation and Futures Thinking. And one of the things I've learned in, in SDG, um, the new way of thinking, is also that exactly what you said, that the budgetary process must be aligned with sustainable goals. And you're saying now must be aligned with future thinking. So you, you mentioned New Zealand and you mentioned three points. Can you just elaborate on that? Like how New Zealand aligned their vision with their budget? Because my colleagues and I, um, we will be starting um, hearings on our national budget and it, it is always a difficult process to begin with, but much more now in the time of COVID because, you know, you're like moving resources to health. I mean, that's understandable, but I, wanna, I want to be able to, ve to develop that mindset that, okay. wait a minute, we have to link of the, think of the future too. So we can't just move everything to COVID reaction. You know, it has to be a sustainable plan. Um, should I answer or wait for Senator Del Del Bato Rosa? Sen Bato, did you have a question? Yes, uh, Madam Chairman, if you allow me. Of course, of course. <laughs> Always allowed. Thank, thank you, Madam Chairman. I, I just have a picture. Meeting with the big, big boss. Hello. Please, please, please proceed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to Dr. Sohail. Uh, just my my thought on your narratives. Uh, are you going to entertain another uh, set of narratives which uh, is being espoused by the you know the conspiracy tourists that uh, later on we might find out that this uh, COVID-19 was a biological uh, weapon that has gone wrong, uh, being uh, developed by uh, certain countries. It's your decision which story you wish to live in. Okay, okay. <laughs> and I, you know, I live in the world with scientists and ecologists, and we have our data. Okay. But I, my role as a futurist, how do we use story to transform? So clearly, if one wishes to play the blame narrative, then going with the data, this is a bioweapon, will help you. Will that in 10 years? enhance women and children, et cetera, probably not. So there's a scientific basis for every story. And then of course, as you well know, there's another narrative for every story. Thank so you. So clearly those of us in the scientific community are wondering, what do we do to bring in the conspiracy people? They obviously feel not heard. 
that's part of the big challenge. Now, going back to uh, earlier point is, this is one of my favorite data anecdotes is we were working law enforcement and other groups. They do one study where they had divide the room into two groups. Group one say there's 10 criminal activities in your neighborhood, group two, 10 criminal activities in your neighborhood. But in group one, the metaphor I use is crime is a beast, crime is a beast. Group two, I use the metaphor crime is, uh, is a virus. Then you ask the group, what's your policy decision? If I say it's a beast, people say put money in law enforcement. If you say it's a virus, they say put money in education. So this is where the, the narrative, I would say, is decisive. So those of us who want to communicate a different future, it's us getting clear which future do we want. And so this was the was a, was the center's point earlier. Anecdotally, when I I remember my vice chancellor at university, he said, in our vision of the future, we should all cooperate. It's a great, beautiful vision. We all cooperate. Then we ask, tell us how the budget works. My role as a professor, my budget goes down the more I cooperate. Then I understood, uh huh. So the vision has no link to reality. So the real takeaway was pretend to listen. <laughs> so this is why I get impressed, for example, government of New Zealand. She said, we're moving from a single bottom line, GDP, very important, we all want prosperity, to a triple bottom line. If the triple bottom line meaning people, planet, prosperity, what do I do? She said, well, clearly I will legislate. I work with Department of Statistics in New Zealand. We will legislate. We will count and inform data that's also dealing with planet and people. So concretely, that meant what she said, she will deliver the first well-being budget. It's just to prosperity. It's also we're clear having people in the country who are mentally healthier leads to higher productivity. We know that, right? You have depression. If you have violence against females, basically productivity goes down. So she said, I want prosperity plus SDGs and she's budgeted for it. So this is what we've learned. It's linking vision with data, with story in terms of going from the world is changing. I don't know what to do. Please help me. You look at scenarios. Here's the world I want. How do I make it real? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Let, let me call on Senator Coco Pimentel. He, um, he would mm -hmm. like to ask a question or make some comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. Professor, thank you for your presentation. Uh, you mentioned that uh, for, this, for the different kinds of futures, people will have to learn new skill sets. So that makes me worried for our elderly, the, the, uh, the senior citizens, because uh, of course uh, they would have a shorter period to, to adjust. So do you, do you foresee, Mr. Uh, Professor, a future where uh, society should be more compassionate, understanding, and supportive of the elderly in their society, of the senior citizens? So, I mean, that's one of those things that the answer is, of course, yes. But let me make it a bit trickier. So I was running four set workshops in one city, and everyone agreed in the future we want a policy for the elderly that's inclusive, right? Inclusive elderly policy. I said, great. Then we ran uh, role playing. We ran workshops on people experiencing being 70, 80, 90. And most people in those workshops made fun of the elderly. So then I understood, aha, people want to say let's be inclusive, but if it comes down to a real strategy, they're still nervous. So that's kind of one where it's, it suggests there's a contradiction. The other part of this is we're in a situation where the old skill sets won't work so well, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to think through what new skill sets do I need in every scenario? And clearly every CEO who comes to any of my courses, the one thing they get away, oh my God, I had one CFO, it was focused on data analysis. I said, that's brilliant. And then the missing part of his skill set was obvious, right? He understood data, didn't understand spiritual intelligence, didn't understand emotional intelligence. 
So again, futures is whole of brain, whole of skill sets. We're being multiple ways of being and knowing to create a better world. And clearly, we know those who can identify weak signals, disruptors, as our colleagues from Futures Platform will talk about, they have the ability to be use different skill sets. They don't just use intellect. They don't just use scanning. They use multiplicity. So I would agree with you, this different ways of knowing enhances our ability to anticipate the changing world. So when we run workshops, the thing I always ask, who's not in the room? I was working with the US justice system for 10 years with the FBI as well. And one large project, I asked the justice, I said, good, I got all the attorneys, I got the judges, I got citizens in the room. I want to bring in felons. He said, why do you want criminals in the room? I said, we're seeking to transform the justice system. They're a stakeholder. You're not a stakeholder we might like. Mm -hmm. They have access and assets that we can use to develop a more robust system. The justice laughed. He said, that's a good idea, but I can't get security for the hotel. So you're, you're wonderful, but you're crazy. I said, okay, fair enough. So this is, you know, this, so if I run a futures workshop on the future of aging, I want older people in the room. I want everyone to make my product more robust and the strategy more possible. And of course, some people are difficult. You run a room on future of science and you get conspiracy theorists. What do you do? How do you include them? It's not easy. This is not a, you know, yes. it has challenges. Thank you, Professor. Uh, one thing is clear, uh, the future is going to be more complex and complicated. Hence, society must be more understanding and compassionate to those who will have difficulty adjusting to this uh, more complicated uh, society. So not, may, not only the elderly, but also the, those who have uh, uh, handicaps, uh, mentally handicapped, etc. So, so but anyway, uh, so when we do the budget for our country, we should be conscious that, you know, if, uh, if we are to do some affirmative action or some support, then we have to anticipate the sectors which will have difficulty adjusting uh, to this more complicated future uh, because it requires learning new skill set. It, it sets, it's, it requires people to be multi-talented, uh, be flexible, a whole of brain approach. Not everyone can do that. Or even if, not, even if someone can do that, he might be already uh, lacking the time to do that. So, so my, my uh, insight uh, for this afternoon is that uh, the future society must be more compassionate and understanding. I'm happy with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, before I call on Senator Riza, can you just give a quick reaction to that other than you're happy with that, Dr. Sahil? Only because I've read, I've read some of your materials and you have made very, very strong pronouncements about the need for like a compassionate, um, I, I, you know, you use different words, but you basically said that, that the need for this compassionate type of society as opposed to, you know, GDP in, in the way it's defined. So could you elaborate on that? Because I'm sure Senator Coco Pimentel would be happy to also hear that from you. In, in terms of a vision, I mean, when I, I mean, I remember there was one young person I was working with, right? And we, she was 14. We said, what's your vision for 20, 10 years from now? She said, in 10 years, she'll be a CEO of a green tea health company. So I said, great. So I said, tell me what your narrative is. And she said, my story is the blinds are always down in my room. And her girlfriends with, that were with her started to cry. So now I was running a workshop and there's 10 people crying. And I think, okay, I'm not doing a good job here. And then I said, okay, why are you all crying? She goes, well, she keeps the blinds down. So I said, what does that mean strategically? Strategically, she's only focused on one skill set doesn't know how to open up and understand emotional intelligence, nature intelligence, people intelligence. So she changed her story from the blinds down to let the sun shine in. What that meant tactically was I will now learn new skill sets, whatever they, those are, and then everyone hug it out. So at the personal level, we can see that's important. Very clear to me at the aggregate level that these different skill sets are not economy in deficit. So if you look at South Korea, they start playing with the indicator called gross national core, GNC. 
And what does that mean in the real world? In the real world, it meant we will incentivize Korean soap opera. We will incentivize Gangnam Style. We will incentivize that. Now, 10 years later, if you look at the research, Korean soap opera runs Asia. Now, then you look at the economic research, every $100 spent on consuming soap opera leads to $400 enhanced consumption of Samsung electronics. Why? Because they branded culture, people purchase culture, then they purchase real products. So I believe in the soft emotional approach, the spiritual approach. One, it's good in itself, but two, it also helps the economy. And the South Korea case, to me, uh, demonstrates that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sahil. So I give the floor now to Senator Riza Hontiveros. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Dr. Sahil, um, thank you, Sutran. I really, um, your points are very provocative. Um, I really like, for example, what you said about uh, using the future to change the present. So it's really a different way of thinking that could lead to a different way of doing and, and, and living. Also, how you highlighted uh, the narrative um, power value of stories. Um, and that harks back to something that's very long standing and deep in all of our civilizations the power of stories, of myth, et cetera. And of course, I, I loved it that you mentioned you used the term portal because I super enjoyed Arundhati Roy's article about the pandemic is a portal. Um, my question is. Uh, I participated in this uh, workshop before, which seemed to go on your point about using the future to change the present. And the idea there was, um, if we were trying to put together like a change process and among different stakeholders, different groups who uh, never had worked together before or even worked against each other before, um, one, one trick, they actually use that term trick, one trick, positive trick, would be to get all of those different stakeholders to commit to a common vision and then working backwards from that to see how, okay, if we all want to reach a similar vision after all, can we adjust our interests in the present? So that, you know, it's some kind of consensus building or compromise building process uh, and therefore move forward towards the common vision or parts of the common vision. Uh, would you say that this is one example of futures thinking and acting uh, along a futures thinking mode? No, I think that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. Many of the people we work with, for them, futures is risk mitigation. They want, else, they want us to help them anticipate that tomorrow they can reduce their business risk. I think that's fine. I'm very happy to do that. Part two is use the future to enhance opportunities. So the Alibaba example, who will be the Alibabas that will come out of COVID-19? Part three, when there's big differentiation, we disagree. We may disagree on today what we're going to have for lunch. We can agree we all want healthier food. So just as you're saying, we get agreement on that, then go backwards. And so the scenarios then become a way to resolve conflicts. Mm -hmm. And they enhance our conflict resolution ability because you can think of not I'm right, you're wrong. We can think, okay, here's three, four possibilities. Let's develop those and find ways we can all be a little bit more right. So, yes, I totally agree with the way you framed that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you again. And uh, just as a last point, uh, I'm glad you're, you seem to always highlight when possible conflict resolution. Earlier, you said that. Conflict resolution actually leads to lighter budgets, <laughs> less spending, certainly less spending for conflict, but also less spending for conflict resolution. And, um, great how the future thinking um, uh, uh, scenarios shaped by future thinking also enhance that conflict in our society. Uh, there's, I missed the last okay. sentence. Someone jumped Thank in. You. Right Thank you. Thank you. I heard, yeah, I, I heard my name as well. Maybe maybe it's our. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, again, thank you, Dr. Sahel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Riza, do you want to repeat lang your last phrase? Dr. Sahil missed it and I missed it too. Ah, no, I was just um, affirming what he said about uh, these uh, scenarios, these scenarios shaped along future thinking lines. 
uh, apparently tend to enhance conflict resolution. And I appreciate the, uh, the highlight he's throwing on conflict resolution because earlier he also said that um, uh, futures thinking leads to smaller budgets, <laughs> meaning we need to spend less uh, on scenarios mm. where we have um, resolved conflicts or where conflict resolution is um, um, is capacitated in a way in, in our society. So that was all, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Sahil, um, actually, I still have two questions. So just very briefly, because we'll still have time towards the end. I just want to give the floor to our next speakers in a few minutes. But my two questions would be, um, how do you get a country in a futures thinking mode? So that would segue now to my next question, which when I think of change, I always think of the youngest generation. I just, first of all, it's just easier to teach a younger generation a new set, set of skills or a new mindset than to try to change um, people who have been doing the same thing over and over again. So number one, the, 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 I guess one, one sub question there would be, I guess it's a no brainer that you would want to teach young children this this skill how how do you go about teaching that and then number two is how do you get a country and for that i guess specifically government on that on that um you know on that um way of thinking yeah that's one of those huge huge questions <laughs> uh i can just say you know what i've learned is you know, you start where people are at. Clearly for the Philippines, there has to be a local narrative within all the Filipino languages that let's not be past-based, let's find a narrative around future-based. Where can the country be in 2050? And we've seen that in Southeast Asia, that has worked in other countries where they've set up, here's where we wish to be. And you start to work on that and then decisions now are not made on where you were but where you're going in one city i was working with no budget could get approved unless it linked to the 2030 vision and they had to use the four scenarios as their justification so that's a bit of disciplining right here's our vision here's the scenarios if you want a budget for your park you have to link it so that's one way to force people there I remember with the Emirates, they asked me to do a 2030 project. I said, one ministry called me. I said, why do you want to do that? They said, well, the Sheikh said, we can't get funding unless all our projects do risk assessment, do opportunity creation. So one is setting that up as a nation. Here's where we wish to go. Developing the capacities within the president's office, within the Senate to be futures oriented. So that's kind of doable. That's legislative. That takes strong leadership. Then at the local level, you have to start somewhere. When I work with teachers, they say, great, but don't tell me it's one more thing I have to do. I have kids. I have so many classes. I have so much going on. Please don't make my life more difficult. So now when we work with schools, we're always trying to figure out how can we bring in futures that makes their life easier? Because no one wants more things they have to learn. So that becomes part of the challenge. So in one school I'm working with, they said, okay, this worked for the principal. It worked for the board, the teachers loved it. Now let's experiment. So it could be, I'm a great believer in, if it works, you do it, you experiment. The experiment says, yes, you keep on doing it. So you might try it in a few schools, people get excited, they're future oriented. That leads to the literacy and that starts a whole range of self-fulfilling innovation. If it doesn't work, you stop. So I would see this as a new type of literacy that shouldn't make people's life harder, it should make it easier. Now, part of it is then people developing higher cognitive skills. Like there's one group saying, well, Australia's COVID-19 modeling was wrong. They predicted 150,000 deaths if nothing was done. And so now three months later, the deaths are at 100. So they're saying, well, that was bad modeling. No, I said, that was brilliant modeling. That was scenario one, if we do nothing, Here's the death rate because we're so connected to virus travel patterns. If we act, here's what it leads to. So it's honoring prevention as a tool that helps us reduce costs so we can put money in where it should go. 
Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so, um, Dr. Sahil, I will um, ask you to stay on for more okay. questions and aster answers later on. But for now, um, and I'm just going to double check if I missed any of my colleagues. I think I've called on everyone who had a question. Um, so now I'm going to call on um, Dr. Tumo and um, Saku Kashikanen to um, also discuss with us, uh, particularly about futures platform using technology and um, the coast post-COVID radar. Dr. Tumo and Saku, you're welcome and thank okay. you for coming. <laughs> no, thank you very much for having us. It's an honor to be here. So thank you, Senator, and all the senators. So uh, my name is Saku Koskinen. Uh, we come from Finland, Helsinki, Finland, actually. So it's good still morning. morning here. Good, <laughs> thank good you. Morning. Good afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon. And uh, also, Dr. Tuomo Kuasa is joining me here. So he's obviously one of the founders of the company. Uh, yes, I'm one of the first employees. On my behalf as well. Yes, okay. And uh, uh, I will be explaining a few words quickly about the company and why did we find and create this technological platform. So this is a Finnish innovation, technical innovation. And then Tuomo will take on the radar itself, which is one of the key elements uh, of, of our platform. And he will, he will uh, explain on and pick up a few trends and phenomena related to the, the COVID and post-COVID situation. So uh, let me share my screen with you and just please acknowledge that you can see, see the slides in front of you. So you can see this about us and based on strong expertise. Yep. Okay, great. So uh, a few words about the background and then uh, Tuomo, please, you can of course uh, then present yourself, but uh, very quickly about the background. Uh, we, we are a Finnish company, as I said, and it's founded on a, a experience uh, related to future studies and foresight work also market intelligence and participatory, participatory planning. So we are all actually, uh, well, Tuomo is also an academic, uh, academic expert, but most of us, the rest of us in the company are also practical experts in, in, in business consultancy and foresight work. So we, in our previous work, found that uh, the foresight uh, work processes, whether, whether they link to strategy innovation or any other uh, operations in, in, in a company or organization uh, requires a lot of time. Uh, also takes a lot of, I would say, manual work. And we were trying to think of uh, new ways on how to work in a more lean and quicker and a digital way. And uh, that's why Dr. Dorma and his colleagues actually came up with this uh, futures platform, which was back then uh, uh, worked around the key element, the foresight radar, which we'll look, we will look at the moment. So, so the need for this solution, the tool came from practical purposes. Uh, we are actually working with about 10,000 foresight professionals around the world. So we're very proud to work with uh, uh, different governments, uh, different foresight experts, strate strategy experts. So we work with the Norwegian tax office, Finnish tax office. Uh, we helped Abu Dhabi government, uh, nine departments last year on continuous foresight processes. We work with European Commission Joint Research Center, so one of the teams there. Asian Productivity Organization, Business Finland is, is actually a, one of the key organizations, also very, very close to your, your operations as well. So in a way, yes, we, pro we provide technology, but we're also very uh, happy and proud to be working with experts on, on foresight around the, around the world. So that's quickly about the background, Tuomo, maybe, Say a few words about yourselves. Thank you. Uh, so, yes. Can, uh, yeah, this, yeah. This is Tuomo Kuosa. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm one of the co-founders of the of the company, and I have 15 years or or more uh, background in in foresight, strategic foresight. Um, my PhD thesis was related to foresight and and four four books um, from the from this area so far as as well. So um, I'm working as a content director and the, and the leading futurist in the company. 
Tom, can you say a few words about the team that you're working with? Because this is one of the unique elements that, as I said, that yes, we offer technology, we offer an AI-based platform, but also the, the very important part of our operations is that, in fact, we have a uh, trained uh, futurists working with the tool. So they manage the tool and they operate the tool uh, for the benefit of our customers. So maybe a maybe few words on about the team. Yes, I'm, I'm leading the team of futurists in the, in the company. So uh, I have six futurists who are masters from the, from the Turku School of Economics uh, Futures program. And, um, and, uh, and then we have the external experts as well. But uh, the, the core of the team is, is future studies itself, uh, strategic foresight. And uh, we, are, we are studying, uh, we, ha we have 30 major thematic areas, which we are studying in our horizon scanning on daily based searches. And uh, we are combining the AI elements. So it's AI based, but human curated working. We, we have an internal peer system, a peer review system, uh, where we validate the, the trends and uh, phenomena that we are able to identify. And um, we are constantly monitoring the changes within the, within the trends. So now the COVID-19 uh, change that went forward has actually changed the, the, the environment where we are operating very much. So more than 100 phenomena and trends have changed due to the COVID, and that's a major change. And uh, of course, we haven't mapped everything yet, so it's underway. But we have the big database. Um, almost 10 years we have been doing uh, the trend analysis, a phenomena analysis. So we have more than 700 trends phenomena in our database, which are constantly updated. All this data set um, can be used in any, any foresight project that we take forward. Yeah. The yeah. changes within these trends and phenomena, that's something we need to um, monitor, keep monitoring and editing as the, as the COVID has actually taken these severe steps forward. Thank you, Tuomo. Thank you very much for describing. So, so as, as, as Tuomo elaborated there, uh, it is very, in a, in a way, unique approach that, yes, uh, we have a AI-based technological tool, but at the same time, we have the experts working there daily uh, for the, in behalf of our, our customers and clients. And of course, yes, we have Mr. Sail in Atula as a friend. <laughs> so, hi, Sail. Great, great to see you again. So yeah, we have a content advisory board. Uh, these are these are gentlemen here who who, who work with us uh, also and uh, are part of our network. So we work with an extensive network of experts, and uh, and it's it's great to be working working with them. They all look uh, look at the future and the foresight from different perspectives, which is of course also richness uh, in in this work. So we collaborate with all the different uh, foresight experts, and we are happy to collaborate. So. So that's part of our work as well. So makes us a little bit more diff different from other technical providers as well. So uh, okay, uh, well, actually, as, as Sohail actually described the, the the foresight futures thinking very well in the beginning, we also uh, use this uh, description of VUCA. So this is an acronym uh, comes from the words volatile or uncertain, complex, ambiguous. So this is a way to describe the operating environment that where we live in. Uh, this is funny. We were, uh, we were, we have, we were having to explain this to a great extent before the COVID. Now we don't anymore. So, so in a way, uh, this is a one way to look at the the operating environment or the environment that we need to operate in, uh, and we feel this is a, this is a good way of of describing it in a way that any change or any situation we're in, there's a lot of volatility involved, as we've seen. So there's the speed and the force and the change and the insta instability has, has become the very, very like integral part of this modern world. Also, also, as we know, and as Sohal said, there's a lot of uncertainty and we, we, we cannot know everything. And, and so it's a lot more unpredictable than it used to be. Uh, you know, as we know, there's misinformation, there's disinformation. So we need to be dealing with a lot of different levels of information and futures and foresight data. The world is also complex. Uh, there's uh, the rise of connections, uh, multiples, 
existing interlinkages. So this is ex extremely complicated uh, uh, to, to kind of, you, you cannot predict, as Sohal said, you cannot predict uh, the, the chain of events that easily anymore. And also there's a lot of ambiguity. ambiguity. So uh, there's, there's a lot of confli conflicting and competing explanations on the same issue. So this is why we and, and we really believe that foresight as a process, as a methodology, and of course the foresight tools are a great way to navigate in this environment. You know, you, you need to make long lasting plans for your government. You need to understand the future to, to the best extent. So this is, this is where we see that foresight really can help. And also the practical challenges our clients face daily are listed here and of course there's a lot of more but where we're trying to help the organization is definitely to deal with the information overload that's one thing uh, as we we discussed that we are bombarded with information all the time it's difficult to find and to pinpoint the relevant information and futures and foresight information to fit and suit your context in question it, it's difficult it's time consuming also, because the world is bulk, it's more and more difficult to get a comprehensive overview of the operating environment and, and the environments we work in. So we, we, we like to call this the 360 view. Also engaging people, as, 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 as in Sohail's uh, 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 example, uh, communications played a big part. Also engaging people to, to build insights, to gain insight, to get people involved, and as Sohail said, different types of people in processes is vital, it's very important. And of course, staying on top of the changes, it's not enough anymore to have a foresight, uh, to do foresight once in two years and to decide, okay, these are the same mega trends as we did, you know, identified last time. It needs to be a constant, continuous process. It doesn't need to be a heavy one, but there should be in place a way of working in a constant and continuous way around trying to make the sense. So these are pretty much the challenges we, we've seen uh, globally, and these are the challenges we're trying to address and to help the organizations with, yes, through technology, but also through expert knowledge and, and, and a foresight knowledge and understanding. And this is actually why we have created uh, a Futures Platform. So it's an artificial intelligence-based tool, technical solution, and uh, it allows you to kind of create the comprehensive visual image, picture, radar around the changes to the future, but it also helps the key people in foresight practices to organize the foresight knowledge, foresight information, and to utilize it in, in any given moment and situation or context. And also it al allows you to do collaboration, co-working, and uh, collaborate with different stakeholders in order to build the future. So, so this is the kind of the AI powered solution and uh, includes the content created and validated by the futurist as Duomo described before. So that's pretty much what we do and also what we have as an offer. And then on top of that, of course, we do uh, consult and do expert advice on foresight processes and, and, and kind of a more on uh, foresight, practical foresight uh, processes and tools. So thank you. That's from my behalf uh, about the company and now I will uh, allow Tuomo, Dr. Tuomo Kuosa to go through our COVID, post-COVID radar, which is one of the elements of the platform. And we have created for this particular situation, especially that we are all faced in, which is a challenging situation. So Tuomo, thank you. You can continue from here. Tuomo, you are on mute. Sorry, we cannot hear you. So if you press the mute. Uh, yes, shall I share my view? Uh, okay. Yes, please, and you can see the radar in front of you. Yes, so I can yes. click on. I can click and just advise me on what to do here. Um, do you want to share your own? Do you want to share your own screen? Yeah, my own screen. Oh, okay, all right. If you share, and then that's fine. I'll stop sharing here, yeah. and then you can, I think, share your own screen now. Okay, proceeding. Have 
Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, very good. So here we have the Foresight Trader, COVID-19, the world after. And um, telling briefly first the, some main, main issues, how to, how to read the radar. Uh, so it, it has six sectors, which are all dealing uh, uh, specific point of view or angle to the, to the uh, change of COVID-19. Health and well-being starting from one o'clock, the working and living industry and manufacturing, service and consumer, consumer, consumerism, economy and trade, and finally, society and preparedness. So we have selected these six uh, points of views to describe the general COVID-19 change. There are, of course, many other angles which could be taken, taken to, the, to the overview. And, uh, and of course, we can, we can produce very many types of, of foresight overviews to different cases. For example, uh, I'm working at the moment with the Finnish uh, Transportation and Communication Ministry. And for them, we have provided uh, a foresight radar, which is dealing with the COVID impacts due to traffic and communication specifically. Then another an case, which is underway, is uh, the economical crisis of Finland, or actually how to prevent it. There is an association established for that, and we are focusing on the economical issues. So how to mitigate the impacts of the COVID-19. And that's an uh, entirely other, other way to go forward. But this radar, which you see at the moment, this is a general overview from global global perspective. So this is not specified for Philippines or Finland or any other country. This is uh, very global. We aim to see uh, how it seems to be, what kind of things are emphasized in, in, in global scale in average. Uh, the initial shock, that's the, the core of the, of the radar. Then we have phenomena and trends that we have gathered there uh, that seem to be uh, emphasized um, during the initial shock. Uh, these changes have actually gone forward quite strongly within the, the first months. But then as we move forward, the, the second, uh, second uh, frame is recovery. And there we have things that we start to see at the moment as we are moving towards the recovery from the initial shock. And there are, there are uh, other type of things. Um, then finally, word after is the, the outer circle. And there we have things that uh, we, we estimate that these things start to be, be emphasized more and more uh, as, the, as we finally uh, uh, pass the, the COVID-19 crisis. So there are some changes that will be sticky after after this COVID is passed. Um, the color coding here uh, represents um, types of changes. So the green color code uh, represents changes that are getting stronger. Like for example, if we look at the initial shock part, um, here we have, for example, life indoors. That is something that uh, has clearly became strong trend during during this, this crisis. Uh, then remote work and edu education. This is, this is clearly uh, a new trend, which is probably becoming more and more sticky. Some of these changes are like V curves. So the, the change itself uh, may be dramatic at the beginning, but then after the, the crisis is passed, we go back to the normal. So it's like a V curve. But in some cases, uh, the, the changes will stay st will be sticky. Like for example, in the case of remote work and distance educa education, this is probably going to be quite sticky, sticky change to some extent, until I present it as, as well. All these are marked green as they are getting stronger. Uh, then we have some changes that are marked with blue color. Uh, for example, walls uh, in the working and living sector in the, the outer circle. That is something that uh, we, we estimate that this is getting, um, this trend is uh, weakening. So uh, the walls itself, the, the value of the walls is decreasing. So the walls are around universities, the walls around people at the offices and so on. 
So we, as we are working more and more um, online, um, the, and uh, universities start to operate more, more and more online, um, the, the need for physical spaces is reducing, and uh, and also the, the the spaces that are left behind or actually are, are, are used um, will be more adaptive and modifiable, and. Um, we are getting more, more and more mobile ways of, of working and studying and, uh, and in our social interactions. So the blue color code represents things that are weakening in the, in the change. Then red color code, that is um, um, quite interesting uh, futures knowledge part in, in this overview. So the, the red dots are wild cards, things that may go forward within the change but we are not sure are they are they going forward as they are presented for example deglobalization during the recovery phase there have been a lot of signs of that deglobalization goes forward um, even before the COVID-19 but as the as we have seen the changes um, changes during the, the the crisis it seems even more more plausible that that deglobalization really goes forward. There is an other wild card. If, the, if this deglobalization really takes some steps forward, we may end up to, to geoeconomics wild card, which is actually uh, representing the world where uh, the deglobalization is uh, uh, splitting the world economy into three different domains. One. Uh, dominated by Europe, one dominated by North America, and one, and the third one dominated by China. And then we have, of, of course, uh, Russia and Japan and many and other countries which are, uh, are uh, to some extent, part of these different uh, domains. So we may end up to be in three different economic areas which are transporting internally a lot, but, uh, but um, an, uh, um, importing and exporting quite few goods uh, from, from, uh, from economical area to another. So they are like, a, like solid, solid economical areas. Um, then we have, of course, a lot of other wild cards, uh, especially in the world after part. Uh, for example, city self-sufficiency. This is something uh, that uh, it used to be it used to be quite a remote thing. Uh, it didn't seem plausible before COVID-19, but actually the COVID-19 change, as, as we are seeing the, that the, the, the national security of supply uh, hasn't been sufficient in most of the countries. And countries have been um, um, un, quite unprepared for, for this crisis, even though we, we um, we actually we thought that we were well prepared, but uh, but uh, in, in when the crisis is in this magnitude, uh, it seems that uh, countries and especially uh, areas and even cities were not prepared well enough to this this crisis. So this is giving some uh, fuel for for the kind of thinking that maybe uh, economical areas uh, smaller than than the, the countries. The country itself, uh, like a like a region or or a big city, maybe they they should be self sufficient as well, um, and this is something which may may go forward uh, within this change. It is still a white card marked with with red color, but uh, but it is uh, starting to be more and more plausible. There are a lot of a lot of things in the radar, as you can see. I'm I'm not going through all of these um, and at this point, but this is just giving some idea what kind of material we are able to uh, deal with. So yes, thank you. Thank you, Tomo. So thank you for the description. And uh, that's pretty much on the, on the presentation. We're of course happy to, to hear some questions you might, you might have. And, uh, and just to recap on, on, on these items. So, uh, as as Tomo was explaining, these different types of futures, information, uh, phenomena, trends, weakening, 
trends, uh, strengthening trends, wild cards, weak signals. These are definitely the core and the key element on, on when, when doing and, and, and working with the, towards the future and working within foresight. And this is the kind of the key information that we, we as an expert uh, uh, provider, of course, deal with. Yeah. Um, so, well, one, one more thing uh, regarding these, these wild cards. Uh, we have here a deadly pandemic. Uh, it's, it's actually marked here in the initial shock part related to health and well-being. But this is something uh, that has been in our database since 2012. So the, the role of the wild cards is, is uh, something that they may jeopardize all the plans, everything that, that we have prepared and what we uh, estimate to be plausible. Uh, some of the wild cards are actually going forward. Like almost every year, there are some wild cards going forward. And some of these are very dramatic. Which, which, are, which are changing almost everything. Like in the case of COVID-19, this deadly pandemic wildcard actually became reality. And we are now living, living this, this wildcard being real. Uh, it's still in the, in the radar marked with red color because uh, we, we can estimate that every five or seven years, we are getting a new pandemic. And that was the estimation before. And, uh, and uh, COVID-19 will not be the last one. So we are, we are seeing from the diseases front more and more things challenging us in the, in the future. But there are so many other wild cars, mm. like uh, more than 100 wild cars, but which are able to challenge us almost as in the same magnitude as the, the COVID-19. Thank you, Tom. Yes. Thank you, Tomo, and um, that was that was very interesting. And I will um, get back to you for some questions. Thank you, also Saku. But let me first um, recognize uh, Senator Cynthia Villar has also joined us, so she's here. And uh, colleagues, if you have any questions, just feel free to send me a message. I'll call on you. But maybe um, can we can we can we put back that last slide, the one with the wheel? Um, I would like to ask you to illustrate. Um, by clicking on a few items that, uh, you know, so everyone who's listening could have a, um, an illustration. And I will also pinpoint a few, but um, if my colleagues or even the, the staff of other senators, I want to send a message as to what you want to click on to, to by way of example. Um, but first question, because I missed it. Um, Blue is things that are weakening, and red is like the wild card, like may go forward, but we're not sure. So green is happening, is that correct? Green means it's happening now? Yeah, it's, it's, it's getting stronger. So Get it's, stronger. we are using S-curve analysis. So in S-curve analysis, uh, the green is marking actually the very rapid, like exponential change. It's, go, go, it's, it's getting stronger very fast. And uh, at some point, some the trends are actually reaching uh reaching the the point uh when when they are starting to decrease like the the, the market is full fulfilled with the product or there is no more need or uh for for certain type of approach for example so it's uh so it's uh, starting to weaken after, after that that point so the green portion is where you uncircle the green like it's it's happening now it's very strong yes yes and uh, then we have one one color which is actually not in this this radar. It, it, it's gray color. That is uh, referring to weak signals or strong signals. Uh, something that is not getting stronger at the, yet, at, at at least not in in big magnitude. So they are still very small things, but they have the potential to become a bigger thing that that uh, that would be marked with green color. So it's early information green color okay so um if you can bring it back to the wheel now yes the the wheel the circle okay let's see Tomo, you can reshare it so i I'm, I'm i'm trying to reshare okay now now it's going all right okay no. so um so I'm going to look at the inner circle, which is the initial shock. And a lot of them are green. 
So for example, um, if you say online stores, it's green, that means online sales is, is happening now very strongly, right? And we know that, we can see that, right? That's, that's kind of a given. Um, and then life indoor is also very green. So if you could click on life indoor, um, I, I want to I, I want to try to visualize like as, as a lawmaker, as a policymaker, what about this can we see that should be affecting our um, decision making skills? You know, because this basically means that it's happening now. People are staying indoor. They obviously they want to protect themselves. They're trying to avoid the crowds, the virus. And so what should policymakers now be thinking of, right? Given that many people will be staying indoor. And I don't know if through this mechanism, you also have sort of a prediction on how long this will last. Like obviously they say maybe two years, uh, if it takes that long for a vaccine to be put into place, to be distributed, maybe three years by the time it gets to different developed countries. So can we, yeah, can we, can you say a little bit more about that? Uh, yes. So the, the phenomenon itself, the, the life indoors, that used to be like a potential change. I think that was like a wild card just uh, just a couple of years ago. Mm. It has been changed to be uh, green with green color. It, it has become reality where we are living at the moment. So that's actually one, one, one of the ways how we operate with the information. At, at, at the first, at the beginning, they are usually the, the issues that we we identify that they are possible or probable. They are first uh, gr with gray color, weak signals, or they are wild cards, like like uh, exaggerated uh, descriptions. That what if this actually this scenario goes forward, like the pandemic pandemics? What if this goes forward? What kind of world impact it would it would provide? Uh, the life indoors that used to be a wild card. Um, representing a uh, world where we are living at, at this, this moment. So we are changing the, the color coding of the, the phenomena and descriptions as the time goes forward. And that's, that's, that's one part how we, we aim to uh, uh, represent uh, the, 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 the change, the change itself. There are a lot of phenomena in the database uh, which, are, which are not changed at least not yet due to this uh, COVID-19 change as, as we, we need to make, make the, uh, the, the studies and the uh, assessment, uh, what kind of change is actually going forward. And this is also we have the timestamp uh, or the time range. Uh, if Duomo, you can pinpoint it on the top of the card. So yes. uh, all the content that we have has been labeled and tagged. Uh, so we have a tagging system behind. Uh, we don't have time to go into that. So it's all uh, tagged by AI and humans. And we also, the futures team also give it a time range when it can be seen as the most impactful. So 29 and 39 was the time range for this particular phenomena. Yeah, so that, that, it, time, yeah, that it, time, time frame was given before COVID-19. Before so COVID, so yeah. An example of, of change that, uh, that uh, needs to be if if we are making a new radar where we are uh, focusing on changes around this uh, new living living uh, studying and working environment and what kind of potential impacts this this change is carrying forward um, the, 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 these descriptions these phenomena and the, the time frames uh, need to be changed so that uh, that uh, this overview, is actually uh, valid to the, the context that in, in which we are we are operating. And also the other element that gives a current uh, view is the news feeds we have inside the card. So if you open up uh, any any phenomena from there and you scroll down, uh, there is uh, also live news feeds. So we have a AI robot that crawls the internet 150 million web pages. And it creates about 300,000 news as an ongoing basis. So Tom, if you scroll down to that card, we can see some of the latest news related to this phenomena here. Mm. So 12th or 5th, uh, 4 o'clock in the morning is the last news that the crawler found. 
So that's where we see the, the AI and the robotic software robotics combination with human understanding and knowledge. Because no AI is so intelligent at the moment that it could deal with such a complex information, such as foresight information. It needs human interpretation all the time. And, and, yeah. and this is, we just use it as a helper. So it's our little helper. So Santa's little helper are the elves. We have the AI. So similar way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If I may um, summarize from the last talk we had, um, I think that was a week or two ago. You mentioned that the data that um, you, the summary of, of what is here is based on three, three types of input. One would be the AI. And then there's the input of the futures thinkers who actually interpret it. And then there's also crowdsourcing, right? Is that correct? Yeah. The three? Absolutely yes. correct. Absolutely. Yes, yeah, yeah, uh, I can be your intern now. Yeah, crowdsourcing and, and also we, we are we are getting information from, from the research projects that we are carrying out. For example, if we have a big medical company and we are working with them or construction company, and we, we do foresight for, for a specific field, we are able to identify um, uh, changes and concerns that they have, what kind of things they are, um, are considering uh, probable and what kind of things they consider in, impossible and what kind of things uh, they are worried about. And what, exactly. what, that, 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 what kind of things they are, uh, are, uh, are uh, estimating to be like very, very probable. And all that knowledge, that, or in that knowledge, there are many parts which is not public knowledge. We are actually getting very deep inside knowledge from different industries. So we are focusing on 30 different industries. Uh, health and well-being is one of those and construction and other one as, as mentioned. Uh, and uh, and once, once we identify new knowledge, like weak signals from, from that industry, we are um, making assessments of that knowledge and comparing it to the database that we have. And based on that comparison, we, we make the decision to to uh, make some changes to the content uh, regarding that industry. Exactly, like as, as Mr. Sohail said earlier, it's a learning, this is all about learning, it's a learning process. So we also learn from, from, from working uh, with uh, 10,000 different experts around the world. So this is a very, very interesting domain. So I want to also um, highlight a few other um, areas that I thought might be a good um, discussion points. Like you said that gray, um, is like what like under the radar but you're still watching it because it could potentially be a big thing and one of the gray items there is hidden exercise so that's uh, yeah, one yeah. point and then let me just go on to a few others and you can just you know um, respond all together and then I noticed at the bottom left domestic tourism is red so that means that that's that could go anywhere it's a wild card so do I understand that correctly to mean that there's it could be a pop up possibility that given COVID, you know, people might be, there might be a boom in domestic tourism because people won't travel far, but they, you know, that, that desire for travel is still there. So people will be, um, um, you, you know, going around domestically for domestic travel. And yeah. then, and then the third point, just, just out of curiosity, dirty clothes, is this because people are disposing of their clothes after they head out, out of fear that they will, um, um, spread the germs within their, their virus or the germs within their home. So anyway, those are the three points that I just noticed. Yes. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, let's, let's discuss this uh, a little bit further. Okay, uh, the, the dirty clothes, it's open at the moment, so let's take that one first. Yeah, uh, we are estimating that the COVID-19, this crisis that we are having at the moment, the, the hygienic issues, the, the germ safety, uh, is going forward, and uh, that is pushing some, some. Uh, I think it is providing some new demands for the material production, and uh, nanotechnology probably will start going forward due to this change. And the clothing industry may have to start um, um, being prepared for for this this change uh, more more strongly. And, and as we have the sustainable development aims at the same time, maybe the disposable clothes isn't the way to go forward. Maybe it's uh, clothes that have some nano, nano uh, materials that, 
prevent the germs uh, to, to get contamination. That's that's the idea. So the dirty clothes itself, it's a weakening weakening trend. We used to have dirtier clothes than what we will have after the COVID. That's the that's the the logic here. The d domestic tourism that's uh, part of the the world after, and here here we have a trend. It, this is a trend, of course, at the moment. Uh, so we we could mark this with green color. Uh, it used to be a potential wild card, but during the COVID-19, this, this is reality where we live because we cannot fly and, and so on. Um, so the question is, is this going to be a B, B uh, curve? Are we getting back to the, to the uh, intercontinental flights era where we used to be just a few months ago? Or is there a major shift to the world we're actually where we are focusing on the domestic tourism and and uh, like the nature tourism nearby places uh, to be visited and the, the, our own countryside and our own culture uh, in the in the nearby regions cottages uh, or or um, uh, or boating around the, the nature is that going to be the next big big trend replaced by the mass tourism, of, uh, which is done within uh, uh, intercontinental flights. This is dealing with this, this theme, and it's actually, it's, it's still wild card because uh, this is making accusation that, or, or question that, what if this, there is a real change that uh, the, the flight tourism is actually starting to decrease in big scale. And we, we start to focus and by our own will, we will start focusing more on our own country and countryside. So that's the wild, the wild card is, is actually the accusation that, that this, is, this is very much possible, that it's not V-shaped, it's not it, it may be permanent. Um, then we have the hidden exercise, which is a weak signal here. Um, this is, of course, this is, to some extent, this is a trend at the moment. Uh, so people ha have to make some exercises. And if the gyms are closed and, and you are not, not able to go outside even, even for exercising, then, then these different uh, daily routines uh, have to be uh, taken forward in your own house. So this is, a, a, this is actually a new, new type of, of um, way of doing things. It's actually almost a new potential industry. So the hidden exercise and, and uh, is re it's actually related to the isolation economy, which is marked with green here in the, in the services. So isolation economy is actually something that is really emerging as a new economy. So, so, so we have started to, to learn to do everything inside our own houses during the past couple of months. So we have to do the edu education. Children are, in, in, mo in most countries, they are staying inside. Uh, so all the online channels are used for education, for work, and for meeting, meeting friends, and so on. And there are new types of consulting, new types of services, which are making the, the isolation economy possible and making uh, the life inside your own home more livable for whole family. So th there, are, there are new ways to, to go forward within this isolation economy. And these ser new services are actually uh, starting to, to build up a new type of e whole, whole new e economy. And the hidden exercise, that's a part of, part of that, that change. That's the that's the logic logic here. Thanks, Tuomo, and and, and to quickly on on uh, Senator Piakaitano's uh, comment on the collaboration. We have then, of course, different tools for collaboration within the platform, and the radar is actually the visual uh, visual uh, domain where the collaboration tools can be activated. But we don't have time to go into those. But just to highlight that. Uh, it's very oh. easy to start collaborating even with thousand people on the radar you have created. Yeah, thank you.
So, um, uh, sorry, Senator, we cannot hear you for some reason. Sorry about that. Sorry, sorry, I, I muted myself. Um, I'm just curious on this escape from reality also, if you could click on that. But before you go into that, the next question I have is also, um, so how would you, um, how would um, policymakers, whether it would be from a local government level um, or even from a national level, um, you know, be able to use this system and use the expertise that you have? And I, I remember asking this briefly, but we have here with us, you know, um, uh, representatives from different agencies and senators' offices. So maybe you could elaborate on that. Like, for Thank example, you. whether you know whether the example was on the environment. Um, if if um, Senator Cynthia Villar's uh, area of um, interest and expertise is in the environment, so you know um, where. How would you do the collaboration? How would the uh, availability of information that you have be tailored for the Philippine setting? Something like that. Mm. Thank you very much for the question. Tuomo, if it's okay if I answer first and then you can explain yeah. the escape from reality. Yeah. So um, absolutely. Uh, yeah, great. Just open out, just showing the, yeah. the voting, voting uh, tool as, a, as one. Okay, as a collaborative tool. Yeah, thank you for the question. This is very much what we design together with different operators. As Tuomo described, he's working with the Finnish Ministry of, of, of Transport and Communications. We worked with nine, uh, uh, they are equivalent of ministries, but they call themselves departments, nine departments of Abu Dhabi government last year. So often in these cases, it goes by, like you described, by domain uh, per domain. So you can create different radars for different domains or issues or themes that you are working with within your government, for example. So the radars can look, uh, look at the future from different perspective and they would have a different selection of trends and phenomena related to that context. And then the process is how they go forward. Often the government might have already in place a foresight system or process. So there we would be the partner of that particular team running and facilitating that process. In other ways, it might not be in place. So we can be also in assisting and aiding and helping to build this kind of a system and process. And often it doesn't need to be complex. It, it could be just even an agreed group and team that facilitate the foresight and futures work within the government. And then they would have different roles. They would be the ones facilitating, then they would be the ones participating. So you can also have different levels or roles within the process. And all we recommend that it should be, in a way, ongoing. Uh, it should be repeatable. Whether you do it per quarter, whether you do it per month, per week, it's up to then, of course, the organization in question. For example, I will give you an example from the Finnish Ministry of Transport now and, and Communications. Because of the COVID crisis, it's such an intense situation. They are having weekly breakfasts, foresight breakfast sessions, where they uh, lift up certain phenomenon trends, and then we are facilitating those in this case. Uh, the idea is that they will take the facilitation onto themselves in the future, and we don't, we're not needed. But they're using the platform as a key element. So I hope that answered the question. Um, it answers my question, but I'd also like to use another example that um, has also been an interest to me, but for many senators as well. Um, so, as an agricultural-based country, to the extent that we have millions of um, Filipinos who are in the agriculture economy, um, but the reality is that um, they are they do not earn much. So they contribute they contribute very highly to the food chain, but they are probably the least paid because it's usually traders that um, make the bigger margins and so on and so forth. My question is this. Um, meanwhile, other countries um, have been highly subsidizing agriculture. And um, there are a lot of studies now that show that the way the world eats is not sustainable. So even if our country became um, more economically, um, uh, if, even, if, even if the wealth uh, that we have is able to trickle down to the farmers. Uh, the fear is that this way of farming is not sustainable. 
and uh, that that's one that's one theory um and that is also why there is a big push for vegan or more vegetable or more even um what do you call this um processed food to the extent that it goes away from the usual you know um feeding feeding um pigs and cows and so on and so forth so do you have anything along that because i've always thought that um two things that we need to keep in mind is we need to give jobs to to this big sector of our economy but that also how sustainable is that so that if there needs to be a shift um we should all start talking about this shift as well Yes, very good. Thank you. Uh, I uh, can you see the food yes. radar in front of you? Yes. So I I just went and accessed the platform and I uh, picked up uh, a radar that we have created for particularly for for this question you just aroused. So in fact, we have the thirty themes uh, that Tuomo uh, uh, earlier described, and food and and nutrition is one of them. So we have these ready templates for you to use from all over the, from the seven hundred phenomena. So here. We have agriculture and primary food production as a segment uh, sector, food safety and security, food processing and technologies. So here you can see specific items of phenomena related to the question of food. Yeah. So, uh, so to answer that, yes, you can work around that topic. You can work around all the different topics. Of course, what we would need to do with, in your case, and I think you described it very well yourself, we would need to understand the local phenomena and trends. And that's something we would then, of course, collaborate with you people. So we, we would then together think that what's missing, obviously not everything is here that's locally relevant to you. And we would then add it, or you could add it yourself because you can, you can have then, you can also edit and add your own content and data onto the platform if you so wish. Okay. Yeah, that's great. That's, that's, I, I thought you would have like three or four circles but you have a whole you have a whole yes, other, there's a whole selection a selection <laughs> on agriculture um then the other thing I, I wanted to ask if, if um it is also um address is behavioral change because um like in the philippines and a lot of asian countries we are rice we are a rice eating nation and so even even if um all all um scientific evidence will tell us that you know rice is not the most nutritious food out there it will require behavioral change for people to shift uh, out of that so is it something that can also be um applied here or studied here and then after that i'd also like to give the floor to um dr Sohail also because i'd like to hear his thoughts on agriculture as well Mm, yes, very, very good. And then Tuomo can, of course, elaborate uh, be be better on the content. But just to answer quickly, yes, you can, because what you can do, you can edit that radar. So you, we could we, we should actually add a sector uh, with the social, ethical and, and the buyer behavior sector. And we could add relevant trends related to that, which we already have in the database. So, yes, it can be done. Yeah. By the way, there is the salt water rice. Uh, the green dot, you can actually open open that one. It's related. To that. It's uh, in in eleven o'clock. First circle. Gray dot. There. Yeah, there are, there are many ways to go go forward. Uh, as, as explained, uh, we can open a ready-made uh, radar uh, where we have the, the content which is uh, considered like a globally uh, globally uh, most um, obvious changes and potential wildcards that are re re related to, to the change of, of food uh, agriculture and and uh, and this this domain. Uh, from that setting, uh, you are able to just uh, start the, the collaboration where you can both uh, make uh, some assessment access and, uh, and identify issues that are, for example, uh, the biggest potential uh, 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 as 
like what, what, what are the issues which uh, would provide the best outcome very fast and, and with the, the, the smallest economical uh, investment for Philippines? That, that sort of assessment could be done, for example, uh, the Senate, Senate would be would be able to do do that kind of voting and rating, and, and you would you would identify uh, the, your shared understanding. What are the issues that you, you should focus, and and then taking another assessment, identifying the biggest threats that are actually jeopardizing the the food safety of Philippines, or for example, or what kind of uh, economical safety uh, jeopardizing issues there are in the in the food safety. So you can take different types of, of uh, assessments uh, within the, the same same radar. You are able to identify the, the two by two matrix uh, things that that uh, you should you, you consider that you should grasp uh, uh, in, in in the country, and then you can take another round uh, where where you can open up the for example expert experts discussing. Uh, what kind of uh, opportunities, threats there are, and the senators then would be discussing on, on third area, discussing uh, within these same, same changes, what kind of action points are needed, what, uh, how, we, how, how you would address these, these challenges to, to be uh, taken, taken forward. So there are many, many types of, of collaborative tools, how, how, you can, how, how you can go forward from these different ready-made uh, yeah. templates. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, and, thanks. And then uh, you can, of course, edit these these templates very easily. Saku, Saku can show the the editing editing as well, and uh, bringing your own material there. So so it, you can actually have the setting which is uh, to the point uh, of what what you are dealing with, and then you prioritize bring the bring the broader uh, expertise, and then then you make the strategic planning based on that that's the that's the the, the setting thank you thank you for that can i call on dr sohil to also give his give us some insights about um agriculture and futures thinking I'm unmuted now. Uh, uh, you can hear me okay? Yes. Fantastic. Um, yes. Just a little amazing, bit louder. Okay, amazing pre presentation by the Futures Radar Gang. I was taking notes all the time, so that was just really <laughs> thank, thank you so much. Uh, with agriculture, let me try to define it in four different ways. One. Dr. Sohil, can your mic isn't maybe your mic um, a little bit louder? Yes, I can. Hold on. Here's all the way. How is it yeah. now? Better. So one is the movement, you know, the Asian miracle has been leaving the village, right? Leaving agriculture. So those of us who've moved to cities, my father was the first one to leave a Pakistani village and he never wanted to go back. Uh, you know, I mean, that's the reality. The villages, no toilets, et cetera. So we're in the stage now how to revalue agriculture and actually give it esteem, give it importance. So that's the narrative part that has to be done. That's throughout Asia. Now, the other part is the long-term. I can't, for me, it's very clear, the new milk, the new meat will disrupt the global supply chain in ways that are unimaginable. Every Asian minister's office I've presented to, I've said, look, Silicon Valley beat Asia in terms of AI. Don't let the Valley beat you in terms of food. The food revolution, if it goes to San Francisco, means the world food production will be done by three, four Silicon Valley companies. The rest of us will purchase their Beyond Meat products. So in the long run, it's the end of agriculture as we've known it. I don't see a way out of that. The medium run is more interesting. Do you go vegan? Yes. We already know the largest milk provider in the U.S. has gone bankrupt, Dean Incorporated. They were the largest, most profitable a year ago, they're gone. They said they could not compete with the vegan market. So there's a major disruption here. The second part of that is, of course, the structure of power. 
We know countries have got wealthier, the East Asian miracle, when there was equity in terms of the bottom and the top. Societies that didn't do so well had a very strong landlord class. So it's moving the structure of agriculture to innovative co-ops. So they get more of the value. So one, new narrative. Two, change the structure of the market of agriculture. Three, move towards the vegan. Four, get ready for artificial food, the new meat, etc. That will change the entire game in ways that I think today we can't really imagine it. I know when I presented this to Australian farming producers, this is a joke I tell at every speech. I said, what should the country do given these disruptions? Uh, you know what the farming producers said? They said, kill the, they said, kill the vegetarians. So I said, okay, that's scenario one. We're futurists. What's scenario two? They said, kill the scientists. Huh. So I said, okay, that's scenario two. What's scenario three? They said, kill the Melbourne coffee drinkers. I said, why? They said, they're early adopters. No one loves farmers. No one values us. This change will already destroy everything we're trying to do. So this became a very tough meeting. And so we had to figure out, given the disruption, how do we revalue farming? So this is uh, not an easy thing, but I think in one minute, I've, I've really, I think, outlined the four things that have to happen. Otherwise, farming, as you know it, as we know it, uh, there's no place for it throughout Asia. Dr. Sahil, I need you to expound on that. Um, there's, there's, well, every, everyone here is interested in agriculture, as I said, because um, we are an agriculture-based country. Um, when you say that uh, to you, the the long run is very clear that 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 is the direction, and is that primarily because there is no other way to sustainably feed the number of people we have? So, number one, is that the assumption there? And as far as you're concerned, that's an irrefutable fact that we will not have enough food as we know it to feed the general population. And um, my second question there is. Um, I have to admit that it's a little bit difficult to fathom. Um, are you actually saying that um, it will just be so much more expensive also to keep producing the way we are producing our rice and whatever, our fruits and vegetables, such that it will be um, Silicon Valley, beyond meat type of, um, beyond burger type of food that will survive but in developed countries that can afford to buy this food or also in, um, in um, developing countries like our countries, like Asia, that where, where we still designate vast kilometers, thousands of kilometers for food production. Can you just elaborate on that a little bit more? And then um, I'll open the floor to any of my colleagues who want to ask questions because we only have a few more minutes. Thank you. Go ahead. So when I was working with FAO and Department of Agriculture in Australia, this is 15 years ago. And we had a similar meeting and I was very clear. They said, you can talk about anything, but you can't talk about the food, the meat, protein, end of meat. I said, listen, listen you're not allowed to do that because the farmers will kill us. So I said, okay, four years ago, that was the only topic. And so it's become very clear to me, all the, all the issues you mentioned, Senator, one cost, real cost, but also with climate change, if you factor in carbon emissions, traditional meat is a loser. Traditional milk is a loser. That's all there is to it. We're going to go by pricing. The issue was taste. They figured taste out. I don't like it, but most people don't mind. So taste, pricing, and accessibility and innovation. That's it. Who's going to beat that? You can't beat that. So now the issue for Asian nations, given that reality, where do we play? Do we put money in how do we create a beyond meat rice company? How do we innovate in this place? When I was working with the Dubai, it was, what would halal in vitro meat look like? There's an entire Islamic market. Why don't you go in first before Silicon Valley comes in? So it's not inevitable that the groups in, in California will win. What's to me inevitable is the technology will win because of pricing, taste, climate change, and changing culture of young people. You put those four together, I can't see a way out. The issue then is where should Asia play? Where should the Philippines play? That issue, there's many scenarios there. 
that part, use the, use the radar group, run a futures exercise, work with the farmers. Given this disruption, where are our strategic advantages? What can we do before anyone? And clearly rice is it, right? How do we play the rice innovation game that other people haven't figured out? I mean, for me, if I don't have rice every day, I'm not eat. It doesn't count as a day if you don't have rice. Why live if you can't have rice? So I'm, you know, I understand that. So this is how do we leapfrog even the leapfroggers? That becomes a far more interesting question and has to be addressed at the president's office, the prime minister's office throughout Asia. Otherwise, otherwise, the same thing will happen. We'll be eating basically the crumbs of the cake suppliers. Thank you. That, that's very insightful. Um, I hate to end on that note because uh, I always like to end um, with positivity. Maybe Senator Marcos, who knows more about agriculture, <laughs> can, uh, can uh, ask you the one important question that will solve all this. Uh, but we have we have to go in like two much. minutes. Yeah, please, thank please go ahead, Mr. Chair. Marcos. Just to greet you and to thank you for embarking on this truly innovative hearing on futures thinking, especially uh, regarding farming and bringing value once again to the farm. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sohel. Uh, that's quite inspirational. So, thank my you. conclusion: with it, there's an opening, Senator. It's not that the future hasn't closed here. That's why futures radar we're doing is so important. There's an opening right. here. That opening won't be forever. I thought I was working with government of New Zealand. I said, look, your metaphor is you sell liquid gold to China. What if someone creates something, a, a new milk? That was a crazy idea. Now there's a company called New Milk. And they said very clearly they intend to disrupt the entire market going into China. That's, uh -huh. We're talking hundreds of billions of dollars there. So maybe the senators with me now can help fund a, uh, a new company that will be called New Rice. That's genius. With you 100%. Let's do it. Thank you so much. Um, we have session in seven minutes, so I'm assuming my colleagues will need a coffee break, a water break, or a bathroom break. So at this point in time, I want to say thank you, Dr. Sohil, Dr. Tomo, Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you very much. I really hope thank this you. is not the last time uh, we see you. I, um, Same here. I would love to engage you more, learn from you, and uh, hope to have some more collaborative efforts with all of you. I don't know if any of my colleagues want to say a few things, but we have a continuation on uh, Thursday at 1 p.m. again. And... Um, to the extent that uh, uh, our resource persons are available, you can still prepare questions and ask for um, their thoughts on anything. Um, and until then, does anybody want to have a few more words? Yeah, Madam Chair. Yes, please. Uh, yes, Senator Coco, please proceed. Is it possible for the Philippine Senate to subscribe to, the, to that uh, platform which was shown to us? Absolutely, yes. We are happy to comply. Oh, so I, I will leave it to the chair to negotiate on the terms. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank I, will, you. I will ask for the backing of uh, Senator Pimentel on that because that's really what I wanted to do. Senator Coco, I'll send you the link because even 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 um even just on the website they have um um videos we can view and uh, um Dr. Sohil also has a lot of interesting things. It will really keep us busy. We can uh detach ourselves from the present and just move into the future with, with this with the experts okay. that we have um senator coco was also asking for some material so i will share what we have but um if there's anything uh specific coco that you want just let us know um but he was very interested in the presentations thank you if we are subscribing madam chair if we are subscribing no need to ask for the presentation because we are going to be able to access the website anyway exactly. <laughs> thank you very much thank you congratulations and it will also be more um environmentally friendly that we don't ask for any we don't have a paper trail so thank you so much i'm trying to check with my staff if there's anything else oh by the way the hearing is 1 30 i announced it wrong it's 1 30 um, um manila time
Okay, so I will suspend this hearing. Thank you so much again so for much. our uh, to our resource thank persons, and thank you to thank everyone you. who joined us. Thank you. Bye. 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 You next week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amjad.